The Great Controversy, Chapter 2 Persecution in the First Centuries When Jesus revealed to his disciples the fate of Jerusalem and the scenes of the Second Advent, he foretold also the experience of his people from the time when he should be taken from them to his return in power and glory for their deliverance. From Olivet, the Savior beheld the storms about to fall upon the Apostolic Church. And penetrating deeper into the future, his eye discerned the fierce, wasting tempests that were to beat upon his followers in the coming ages of darkness and persecution. In a few brief utterances of awful significance, he foretold the portion which the rulers of this world would mete out to the Church of God. The followers of Christ must tread the same path of humiliation, reproach and suffering which their master trod. The enmity that burst forth against the world's Redeemer would be manifested against all who should believe on his name. The history of the early church testified to the fulfillment of the Savior's words. The powers of earth and hell arrayed themselves against Christ in the person of his followers. Paganism foresaw that should the gospel triumph, her temples and altars would be swept away. And therefore, she summoned her forces to destroy Christianity. The fires of persecution were kindled. Christians were stripped of their possessions and driven from their homes. They endured a great fight of afflictions. They had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. Great numbers sealed their testimony with their blood. Noble and slave, rich and poor, learned and ignorant were alike slain without mercy. These persecutions, beginning under Nero about the time of the martyrdom of Paul, continued with greater or less fury for centuries. Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be the cause of great calamities, famine, pestilence and earthquake. As they became the objects of popular hatred and suspicion, informers stood ready for the sake of gain to betray the innocent. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as foes of religion and pests to society. Great numbers were thrown to wild beasts or buried alive in the amphitheaters. Some were crucified, others were covered with the skins of wild animals and thrust into the arena to be torn by dogs. Their punishment was often made the chief entertainment at public feats. Vast multitudes assembled to enjoy the sight and greeted their dying agonies with laughter and applause. Wherever they sought refuge, the followers of Christ were hunted like beasts of prey. They were forced to seek concealment in desolate and solitary places, destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. The catacombs afforded shelter for thousands. Beneath the hills outside the city of Rome, Long galleries had been tunneled through earth and rock. The dark and intricate network of passages extended for miles beyond the city walls. In these underground retreats, the followers of Christ buried their dead. And here also, when suspected and prescribed, they found a home. When the life giver shall awaken, those who have fought the good fight Many a martyr for Christ's sake will come forth from those gloomy caverns. Under the fiercest persecution, these witnesses for Jesus kept their faith unsullied. Though deprived of every comfort, shut away from the light of the sun, making their home in the dark but friendly bosom of the earth, they uttered no complaint. With words of faith, 
patience and hope, they encouraged one another to endure privations and distress. The loss of every earthly blessing could not force them to renounce their belief in Christ. Trials and persecutions were but steps, bringing them nearer their rest and their reward. Like God's servants of old, many were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. These called to mind the words of their master, that when persecuted for Christ's sake, they were to be exceeding glad, for great would be their reward in heaven, for so the prophets had been persecuted before them. They rejoiced that they were accounted worthy to suffer for the truth, and songs of triumph ascended from the midst of crackling flames. Looking upward by faith, they saw Christ and angels leaning over the battlements of heaven, gazing upon them with the deepest interest and regarding their steadfastness with approval. A voice came down to them from the throne of God. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. In vain were Satan's efforts to destroy the Church of Christ by violence. The great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when these faithful standard bearers fell at their post. By defeat they conquered. God's workmen were slain, but his work went steadily forward. The gospel continued to spread, and the number of its adherents to increase. It penetrated into regions that were inaccessible even to the eagles of Rome, said a Christian expostulating with the heathen rulers who were urging forward the persecution. You may kill us, torture us, condemn us. Your injustice is the proof that we are innocent. Nor does your cruelty avail you. It was but a stronger invitation to bring others to their persuasion. The oftener we are mown down by you, the more in number we grow. The blood of Christians is seed. Thousands were imprisoned and slain. But others sprang up to fill their places, and those who were martyred for their faith were secured to Christ and accounted of him as conquerors. They had fought the good fight, and they were to receive the crown of glory when Christ should come. The sufferings which they endured brought Christians nearer to one another and to their Redeemer. Their living example and dying testimony were a constant witness for the truth, and where least expected, the subjects of Satan were leaving his service and enlisting under the banner of Christ. Satan therefore laid his plans to war more successfully against the government of God by planting his banner in the Christian church. If the followers of Christ could be deceived and led to displease God, then their strength fortitude and firmness would fail, and they would fall an easy prey. The great adversary now endeavoured to gain by artifice what he had failed to secure by force. Persecution ceased, and in its stead were substituted the dangerous allurements of temporal prosperity and worldly honour. Idolaters were led to receive a part of the Christian faith while they rejected other essential truths. They professed to accept Jesus as the Son of God and to believe in his death and resurrection, but they had no conviction of sin and felt no need of repentance or of a change of heart. With some concessions on their part, they proposed that Christians should make concessions that all might unite on the platform of belief in Christ. Now the church was in fearful peril. Prison, torture, fire and sword were blessings in comparison with this. Some of the Christians stood firm, declaring that they could make no compromise. 
Others were in favour of yielding or modifying some features of their faith and uniting with those who had accepted a part of Christianity, urging that this might be the means of their full conversion. That was a time of deep anguish to the faithful followers of Christ. Under a cloak of pretended Christianity, Satan was insinuating himself into the church to corrupt their faith and turn their minds from the word of truth. Most of the Christians at last consented to lower their standard, and a union was formed between Christianity and paganism. Although the worshippers of idols professed to be converted and united with the church, they still clung to their idolatry, only changing the objects of their worship to images of Jesus and even of Mary and the saints. The foul leaven of idolatry thus brought into the church continued its baleful work, unsound doctrines, superstitious rites, and idolatrous ceremonies were incorporated into her faith and worship. As the followers of Christ united with idolaters, the Christian religion became corrupted, and the church lost her purity and power. There were some, however, who were not misled by these delusions. They still maintained their fidelity to the author of truth and worshipped God alone. There have ever been two classes among those who profess to be followers of Christ. While one class study the Saviour's life and earnestly seek to correct their defects and conform to the pattern, the other class shun the plain practical truths which expose their errors. Even in her best estate, the Church was not composed wholly of the true, pure and sincere. Our Saviour taught that those who willfully indulge in sin are not to be received into the Church, yet he connected with himself men who were faulty in character and granted them the benefits of his teaching and example that they might have an opportunity to see their errors and correct them. Among the twelve apostles was a traitor. Judas was accepted not because of his defects of character, but notwithstanding them. He was connected with the disciples that through the instruction and example of Christ, he might learn what constitutes Christian character and thus be led to see his errors, to repent, and by the aid of divine grace to purify his soul in obeying the truth. But Judas did not walk in the light so graciously permitted to shine upon him. By indulgence in sin, he invited the temptations of Satan his evil traits of character became predominant. He yielded his mind to the control of the powers of darkness. He became angry when his faults were reproved, and thus he was led to commit the fearful crime of betraying his master. So do all who cherish evil under a profession of godliness, hate those who disturb their peace by condemning their course of sin. When a favorable opportunity is presented, they will, like Judas, betray those who for their good have sought to reprove them. The apostles encountered those in the church who professed godliness while they were secretly cherishing iniquity. Ananias and Sapphira acted the part of deceivers, pretending to make an entire sacrifice for God when they were covetously withholding a portion for themselves. The Spirit of Truth revealed to the Apostles the real character of these pretenders and the judgments of God rid the Church of this foul blot upon its purity. This signal evidence of the discerning Spirit of Christ in the Church was a terror to hypocrites and evildoers. They could not long remain in connection with those who were, in habit and disposition, constant representatives of Christ and as trials and persecution came upon his followers, those only who were willing to forsake all for the truth's sake desired to become his disciples. Thus, as long as persecution continued, the church remained comparatively pure. But as it ceased, 
Converts were added who were less sincere and devoted, and the way was open for Satan to obtain a foothold. But there is no union between the Prince of Light and the Prince of Darkness, and there can be no union between their followers. When Christians consented to unite with those who were but half converted from paganism, they entered upon a path which led further and further from the truth. Satan exulted that he had succeeded in deceiving so large a number of the followers of Christ. He then brought his power to bear more fully upon these and inspired them to persecute those who remained true to God. None understood so well how to oppose the true Christian faith as did those who had once been its defenders. And these apostate Christians, uniting with their half-pagan companions, directed the warfare against the most essential features of the doctrines of Christ. It required a desperate struggle for those who would be faithful to stand firm against the deceptions and abominations which were disguised in sacerdotal garments and introduced into the church. The Bible was not accepted as the standard of faith. The doctrine of religious freedom was termed heresy and its upholders were hated and proscribed. After a long and severe conflict, the faithful few decided to dissolve all union with the apostate church if she still refused to free herself from falsehood and idolatry. They saw that separation was an absolute necessity if they would obey the word of God. They dared not tolerate errors fatal to their own souls and set an example which would imperil the faith of their children and children's children. To secure peace and unity, they were ready to make any concession consistent with fidelity to God, but they felt that even peace would be too dearly purchased at the sacrifice of principle. If unity could be secured only by the compromise of truth and righteousness, then let there be difference and even war. Well would it be for the church and the world if the principles that actuated those steadfast souls were revived in the hearts of God's professed people. There is an alarming indifference in regard to the doctrines which are the pillars of the Christian faith. The opinion is gaining ground that, after all, these are not of vital importance. This degeneracy is strengthening the hands of the agents of Satan so that false theories and fatal delusions which the faithful in ages past imperiled their lives to resist and expose are now regarded with favor by thousands who claim to be followers of Christ. The early Christians were indeed a peculiar people. Their blameless deportment and unswerving faith were a continual reproof that disturbed the sinner's peace. Though few in numbers, without wealth, position, or honorary titles, they were a terror to evildoers wherever their character and doctrines were known. Therefore they were hated by the wicked, even as Abel was hated by the ungodly Cain. For the same reason that Cain slew Abel did those who sought to throw off the restraint of the Holy Spirit put to death God's people. It was for the same reason that the Jews rejected and crucified the Savior, because the purity and holiness of his character was a constant rebuke to their selfishness and corruption. From the days of Christ until now, his faithful disciples have excited the hatred and opposition of those who love and follow the ways of sin. How, then, can the gospel be called a message of peace? When Isaiah foretold the birth of the Messiah, he ascribed to him the title Prince of Peace. When angels announced to the shepherds that Christ was born, they sang above the plains of Bethlehem, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. There is a seeming contradiction between these prophetic declarations and the words of Christ. I came not to send peace but a sword. But rightly understood, the two are in perfect harmony. The gospel is a message of peace. Christianity is a system which 
received and obeyed, would spread peace, harmony and happiness throughout the earth. The religion of Christ will unite in close brotherhood all who accept its teachings. It was the mission of Jesus to reconcile men to God and thus to one another. But the world at large are under the control of Satan, Christ's bitterest foe. The Gospel presents to them principles of life which are wholly at variance with their habits and desires, and they rise in rebellion against it. They hate the purity which reveals and condemns their sins, and they persecute and destroy those who would urge upon them its just and holy claims. It is in this sense, because the exalted truths it brings occasion hatred and strife, that the gospel is called a sword. The mysterious providence which permits the righteous to suffer persecution at the hand of the wicked has been a cause of great perplexity to many who are weak in faith. Some are even ready to cast away their confidence in God because he suffers the basest of men to prosper while the best and purest are afflicted and tormented by their cruel power. How, it is asked, can one who is just and merciful and who is also infinite in power tolerate such injustice and oppression? This is a question with which we have nothing to do. God has given us sufficient evidence of his love and we are not to doubt his goodness because we cannot understand the workings of his providence. Said the Saviour to his disciples, foreseeing the doubts that would press upon their souls in days of trial and darkness. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus suffered for us more than any of his followers can be made to suffer through the cruelty of wicked men. Those who are called to endure torture and martyrdom are but following in the steps of God's dear Son. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He does not forget or neglect his children, but he permits the wicked to reveal their true character, that none who desire to do his will may be deceived concerning them. Again, the righteous are placed in the furnace of affliction that they themselves may be purified, that their example may convince others of the reality of faith and godliness, and also that their consistent course may condemn the ungodly and unbelieving. God permits the wicked to prosper and reveal their enmity against him, that when they shall have filled up the measure of their iniquity, all may see his justice and mercy the day of his vengeance hastens, when all who have transgressed his law and oppressed his people will meet the just recompense of their deeds, when every act of cruelty or injustice towards God's faithful ones will be punished as though done to Christ himself. There is another and more important question that should engage the attention of the churches of today. The Apostle Paul declares that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why is it then that persecution seems to be in a great degree to slumber? The only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standards and therefore awakens no opposition. The religion which is current in our day is not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the Word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church, that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. Let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church, and the spirit of persecution will be revived, and the fires of persecution will be rekindled.